Good afternoon. I'm going to start off by giving a short introduction to myself and what I do. So I'm Pooja Anadkat. I graduated from the University of Warwick studying chemistry last year. My options for post-graduation was to go work in industry, to do further study, or to do a graduate program at WMG where effectively I can do both. So I work as a graduate trainee engineer and that means that on a day-to-day -day basis, I work on lithium ion batteries from manufacture to cell testing and at the moment, end of life treatment. So to get started, can I get a quick show of hands? How many of you guys own a car or have parents that own a car? Put your hands up. Okay, now put your hands up if the car is an electric vehicle. Oh, just one. Okay, so as you guys know, the government has put into legislation that by 2040, all cars on the road should be effectively zero emission, and that's to tackle the air pollution challenge. And because of this legislation, if I was to ask the same question again in a few years' time, we'd expect there to be a lot more hands up. So you guys have probably all recognised these vehicles on the road. They're forms of electric vehicles, but do you know what makes them different? So, in mild and full hybrid electric vehicles, the primary source of power is still the combustion engine. So from your physics lessons, you may have learned that it takes a lot more energy to get a car moving than to keep it moving. And this is where the battery comes into play. It reduces strain on the engine during acceleration and start. But in plug-in hybrid and battery electric vehicles, the primary source of power is the lithium ion battery. And because of this, they can run on pure EV mode for a long period of time. So here's an important stat. There are 246,000 plug-in hybrid and battery electric vehicles on the road in the UK at the moment. But in this presentation, I want to focus on the importance of circular economy and specifically end-of-life treatment. So the purpose of circular economy is to keep the raw materials in the supply chain for as long as possible um, to minimise waste. And to understand why this is so important, I'm going to throw at you some stats. So, an average electric vehicle battery pack weighs around 290 kilograms. That's around 20% of the weight of the car. Now, to put that into context, that's the equivalent of having a mountain zebra sat in your car, or four extra people. So imagine taking your mum, your dad, your grandma, and your granddad everywhere with you. You can imagine how big these lithium ion batteries actually are. My second point is that vehicle manufacturers have a legal responsibility to reuse, recycle or recover 95% of the material that goes in a car. So if we take a 1300 kilogram vehicle, really you can only waste the equivalent weight of a tire. My final point is that electric vehicle lifespan is limited by the lifespan of a battery, which is around eight to 10 years. So below 80% function, they become unsuitable for automotive application. So my question is, what happens to those 246,000 battery packs that will come out of cars in 2029 that each weigh 290 kilograms? Well, let's go through our options. Do you think we can landfill these batteries? So I can see some heads shaking in the audience. And you're absolutely correct. We can't landfill these batteries because they have toxic metals that can infiltrate underground and get into our water systems. This would, one, affect human health, and two, destroy our ecosystems. So typically, waste material can also be incinerated to recover energy. And although this is a better route to landfill, it's still not a sustainable option. But with batteries, you can't incinerate them, and this is because they will release toxic vapours like hydrogen fluoride. And for those of you who have watched Breaking Bad, this was the chemical that was used to decompose a body. So we really don't want to be exposed to that. What about downcycling? So downcycling is when you take the part of a vehicle and you use it for a different application of lesser value. So in the example, the bicycle has been turned into a chair. So if we take a battery pack and turn it into a coffee table or perhaps a bench? Well, imagine how ridiculous that would look in your living room. But more importantly, um, what would happen if you sat on a bench with your keys in your pocket? Or if you spilled some coffee on the coffee table? Well, let me show you what might happen. So this is a video of a nail penetration test, and it's commonly used in industry to test the safety of lithium-ion batteries 
by inducing a short circuit. So you really don't want to be sitting on that while that's happening. So unlike alkaline batteries, um, lithium ion batteries do not have a recycling process in the UK at the moment. So we have to ship these batteries abroad to mainland Europe to be, recycling, to be recycled. And shipping com companies do not want to take them because they're hazardous. To add to this, there are several different cell chemistries of lithium ion batteries. So actually it becomes, it becomes really difficult to separate these and apply one process. So the battery makes up the powertrain, and the powertrain is the mechanism in the car that transmits drive from the power source to the wheel. But the electric vehicle powertrain is six times the cost of a conventional car powertrain, and this is primarily due to the battery. So what this tells us is that there are valuable and scarce materials that are used um, during manufacturing a battery. So these are examples of some of the materials that are used in a lithium-ion battery. Put your hands up if you recognise at least three of them. Awesome, okay. So I won't go through all of them, but what I will tell you is that these materials are sourced from all over the world, and cobalt in particular has been identified as an element of critical concern because of its scarcity. So actually, having access to these materials is really important for a stable supply chain. So, now that we've realised um, how important it is to recycle, what actually are our realistic options? So, pyrometallurgy um, is a form of recycling, and if we break up the word, pyro means fire, and metallurgy is the study of metal properties. So, most industrial processes are pyrometallurgical. Um, these batteries are put into giant furnaces, and you recover cobalt and nickel in the form of alloys but the reactive metals are lost, so really you're only recovering about 35%. Hydrometallurgy is another form of recycling. Again, breaking up the word, hydro means water, so hydrometallurgy is using aqueous solution or acid to leach out the metals. Um, hydrometallurgy is used um, alongside pyrometallurgy um, to recover materials from the cathode powder. Um, currently, industry processes recover around 50% with these two processes combined. So what this tells us is it's not very efficient. New processes, however, um, are based on shredding. So just like paper shredders, um, batteries can be broken down into their components and then physically separated using magnets and water and air tables. Um, once you get it into the powder form, you can apply the hydrometallurgy process. This process has the potential to recover 80 or even 90% of the materials, um, and it's less energy intensive, but it's not well understood just yet. And this is where WMG comes in. So at WMG, there's a lot of research going into sustainable processes, right from vehicle dismantling to metal recovery. There's also a lot of research going into new cell chemistries so that it becomes easier during end-of-life treatment. Um, but it's all super top secret, so I, I can't tell you any much more. But finally, on our graduate programme, I've had the opportunity to work on cutting-edge research with industry um, on every stage of circular economy. Um, but recycling has been by far the most exciting one for me. So, thank you for listening.